If you suspect that you're in some kind of toxic relationship, family, friend, metamor, romantic, whatever, doing some kind of individual counseling can help to give not only an objective sense of like whether this behavior is toxic or not, but also it can give you permission to take action. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multi Amory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're talking about toxic relationships. These could be friends, family, romantic partners, coworkers, or even metamors. And so to get us in the mood for this episode, I'm going to read you an excerpt from a poem. You're toxic, I'm slipping under. With a taste of a poison paradise, I'm addicted to you. Don't you know that you're toxic? Oh, it's really beautiful. Thank you. That was a really wonderful poem. Did you write that what, one yourself? Did you just make that up on your own just now? No, that's by the poet Britney Spears. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. She's wow. actually really good, not bad. Classic, yeah. classic Spears. Yeah, yeah she was, is in a you know an anthology of um, female American poets. Oh, nice, uh, yeah. excellent, so. excellent. Well, called, perfect. Called the Billboard charts. I think I it's guess. missing. There. Oh, I know that poem because it's missing. There's like one particular famous line that everyone always quotes that you didn't include. It's um. Mm. Dee, 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 dee. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was like, which one? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's not yeah. a line, it's a, it's a noise. It's just yeah. a noise. Okay, mm-hmm. let's talk about toxicity, shall we? Oh, shall fun. We? Yeah. Sure we shall. Okay, I feel like it gets tossed around a lot. Like, we're talking a lot about toxic relationships or toxic friendships or toxic masculinity is definitely, you know, um, definitely a topic of conversation right now. And I wanted to look and see, like, what is the actual definition of toxicity? Um so toxicity in brief just means poisonous, as you mentioned, your mm. poison paradise. Mm-hmm. Um, some synonyms include uh, vir- vir- virulent, virulent. Um, yeah, I've never known quite how that? to pronounce that. Virulent? It's like vir- virile. No, not like virile. Not, no, 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 no. Like no. a virus. Like a virus. Yes. Ah, virulent. Okay. Um, noxious, deadly, dangerous, harmful, injurious, or pernicious. Uh, so to continue on with the dictionary definition, it's relating to or caused by poison or very bad, unpleasant or harmful. Mm-hmm. As in a toxic relationship. A toxic exactly. relationship. Exactly. Got it. So if toxicity is defined by harm, this is a lot of different types of harm, right? So this isn't just emotional and mental harm, but it could also be physical harm. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> Tedeker, you wrote here a bit like real toxic waste. Exactly. No, it's it's that's yeah. the thing. It's just like the way that real toxic waste, if it gets like leached into the groundwater or <laughs> into the soil, um, it's going to cause long term lasting effects, cause extreme harm, everything from cancer to you know any number of like terrible like reactions. And the same thing happens when there's toxicity in a particular relationship in your life. Mm. I was just in Maine, and it was a really idyllic setting. But there was like a well water that apparently had arsenic in it. So Ooh. he was like, it's not going to kill you now. But if you drink it for like 10 years, Jeez. Uh, that might be a problem. So you know, we were instructed to drink the filtered water. Uh, that's actually a really interesting metaphor, though, for a relationship where it's yeah. not like dealing with a toxic person or a toxic relationship for a day or something. Mm-hmm. It's like you know, probably not going to do much to you, but over the long term, like continually getting that arsenic in your water. It's could, gross. Could, you know, could kill you. And it's yeah. also gross at the same time. Well, Absolutely. So can we clarify a little bit of like what actually are the markers of toxic relationships versus non-toxic relationships? Yeah. So to figure out what a toxic relationship is, I think we first have to look at what it isn't. Um, so healthy relationships, for example, they're characterized by things like compassion, uh, security, safety, uh, free thinking, 
you know, sharing and listening, uh, mutual love and caring, and healthy debates, obviously, fighting or, or having arguments is probably necessary in relationships, but as long as they're done health, healthfully, <laughs> um, disagreements that are healthy are fine, uh, and respectfulness, especially when there are differences in opinions. All of those things are what a healthy relationship is characterized by. Mm-hmm. And so toxic relationships, then in contrast, are characterized by a lot of the opposite (laughs) of all those things, or kind of like the twisted version of all those things, um, such as, you know, insecurity, uh, forms of abuse, particularly abuse of power or control of one partner over another. Uh, I've never seen this turn into a noun before, but demandingness, there's got to be a better word for that. Um, (laughs) Uh, but the like, act of being demanding, yeah, being yeah. demanding, a selfishness, a self-centeredness, um, like intense criticism, negativity, dishonesty, uh, chronic distrust, um, demeaning comments or comments that like pick apart the other person, um, mm. and also jealousy as well. And I think it's a little bit tricky because everything in this list, like we've all felt at different points in our life, not necessarily in the context of a relationship, but like we all go through periods of feeling self-centered or we all go through periods of uh, insecurity or we've all said something that's like maybe a little bit too critical to a partner. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it can be really tricky identifying toxic relationships is because it's not just anything that feels bad means that it's a toxic relationship. It usually means that like there's something chronic, there's something ongoing, there's maybe even something that's like fundamental in this relationship that is kind of keeping these unhealthy dynamics at play. Yeah. And we're going to get into a little bit more about how to identify that uh, a little bit later in the episode, kind of like what to really look for to make that difference between something that's just like a little uncomfortable sometimes versus something that is really unhealthy. Yeah. So the thing about toxic relationships is, like we said before, if they happen over a very long period of time, they can't actually be detrimental to your life and to your health. Um, Apparently, there was this study that was over 12 years that showed that those in negative relationships are at a higher risk, actually, for developing things like heart problems or um, even like having a fatal cardiac episode in their life uh, than those who were in non-toxic relationships. And I guess that makes sense. I mean, everyone says like stress is going to kill you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is just another kind of way that one can be stressed out. Again, going to have like that ongoing day-to-day stress that yeah. wears down your insides, essentially. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like I, It reminds me of in the last episode when we were talking about stress hormones, like with cortisol, and how we didn't really get into it then, but like the idea is that cortisol is a good thing in nature, right? Like for surviving a stressful situation, like if you're trying to escape a burning building, right? Or you're in a car crash or something like that. It's a very good thing to have that rush of cortisol because it's going to make you laser focused and it's going to give you some extra strength and, you know, resilience and speed and things like that. Where it becomes really unhealthy is in our modern day, living in our minds a lot rather than being active and surviving predators. We're those those hormones that would be giving us that edge to survive instead are kind of eating away and wearing us down and causing these long-term negative health effects. And Mm -hmm. so in this case, um, in these studies, they've shown that chronic stress from unhealthy relationships essentially causes um, this thing called CTRA, which is conserved transcriptional response to adversity, um, which is sort of a survival mechanism, uh, a gene expression that's associated with inflammation. And so uh, cortisol is also an inflammation sort of thing that also suppresses the immune system to put those resources in other places. So this is a very similar thing, right? That it's pro-inflammation and lowers the immune system to direct things toward short-term survival, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But this being activated too often and sort of more prolonged can cause chronic inflammation and increase your risk of health problems, especially like heart problems, but also things like adrenal fatigue, right? Which is uh, adrenal being like adrenaline Mm -hmm. um, that because you're getting these levels of these survival hormones 
constantly that you're actually kind of wearing out that part of your body because it's not being used the way it's supposed to. Mm. Like it's kind of always on instead of being this thing that just gets injected when you really need it. Right, right. And in contrast, I mean, there's a lot of evidence and studies that show that good relationships in our lives boost our health and extend, uh, not only increase our quality of life, but also extend our lives as well. There was a 10 year long study in Australia that showed that specifically, you know, people who had solid friend groups uh, were 22% more likely to live longer. There's also been a lot of studies in the States that show that people who have solid romantic partnerships also tend to live much longer and are much less risk for particular, you know, like heart disease or, mm-hmm. or stroke or any number of, uh, you know, diseases, especially those that are often set off by cortisol hormones. Yeah, I, I like this Australian study, though, because it does focus on friend groups because some of the criticisms of the ones saying like, Oh, married people live longer than single people is that those studies were done with people who were unintentionally single, right? People who had a spouse who had died or who had gotten divorced Mm. or something like that, rather than focusing on people who choose to be single. We're like um, happily single. Right. And so this one, I like that it's focused more on the friend group and 22%. I mean, that's, a significant amount yes, uh, to yeah. live longer. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's actually a good transition because of the fact that like a toxic relationship, we're not just talking about romantic relationships mm. on this episode. It can show up in a wide variety of relationships in your life. Yeah. So for example, a friend, you could have a toxic friendship and this is, um, I find friends and romantic partners actually have a lot of the same sort of symptoms and solutions <laughs> yeah. if, as it were. Uh, but this is a friend who, for example, might constantly make you feel uh, lesser, right? Feel less than who you are or who monopolizes all your time but doesn't give anything back or they'll just blurt out criticism and kind of make you feel like you're the one who needs to change, right? Not valuing you as a person as you are. Uh, those are just you know some examples. Um, or you could have a toxic metamor. And this is one that there's not a lot of literature about because this is, you know, something that, that people in non-monogamous relationships kind of get how important these relationships can be, but the rest of the world hasn't caught up yet. Um, but this, uh, you know, could be someone who, you know, is trying to limit your relationships Uh, as a metamor by trying to restrict the amount of time that you get with your partner or um, someone who tries to communicate through your mutual partner rather than communicating directly if they have that option to do it Um, often, you know, often in a sort of a negative way, like causing that other person to sort of be the go between um, or trash talking their metamor feeling like, Uh, I'll get more love from my partner by talking shit about the other person that they're seeing, uh, which I think has a lot of similarity. This reminds me, this reminds me of our drama episode. Oh yeah. It's just like Mm. someone who like brings drama into (laughs) their lives, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess that makes sense that that would totally fall into the drama triangle of... Oh, yeah. Like, exactly. Yeah, and again, in any in any particular role or configuration, you know, the metamor who's talking shit could feel like the victim or they could be the persecutor or they could feel like they're the rescuer in this situation, you mm-hmm. know, like it could just rotate through any of those roles for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, people who are toxic in a romantic partnership, it's it usually like shows up when someone is constantly trying to change you when they're not like happy with the person that you are with the things that you're doing and they just want you to be someone completely different uh, or if they belittle you. Um, And also even in more extreme situations, a toxic partner can be someone who you really don't feel safe or secure around. Um, And again, that can be for a multitude of reasons, not just, uh, physical abuse, which kind of is the one that leaps to mind for me, but also potentially emotional abuse as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And then finally, yeah, someone, some thing that we wanted to add was about coworkers or like a boss relationship. Um, And this could look up or this could come about in like a snide remark way that maybe your coworkers or your boss like makes a snide remark about you uh, that's either directed at you or directed at other workers. Um, There could be abuse of power that happens in a multitude of ways. Obviously we've heard about this a lot with the me too movement um, about the huge abuses of power that occur in 
a lot of relationships with coworkers or bosses. Yeah, so again, any type of relationship that you have with anyone, whether it be romantic, friendship, your metamors, or your coworkers, or even your boss, um, any of those relationships can be toxic. Uh, so it is something to look out for, for sure. Yeah, I mean, another one we hadn't mentioned yet was family. Oh, you yeah. Know, there can oh, yeah. be toxic parent-child relationships or sibling relationships or, you know, cousins or aunts and uncles, right? There's There's lots of different ways that these can show up. Yeah, I think the tricky thing with family relationships is that sometimes it can take so many years before you even realize that it's toxic, especially if you grew up with it. If you grew up thinking like, oh, this way of communicating is normal or this way of relating to someone is normal or this is just the way that we express love and it can take 10, 20, 30 years before you realize, oh, actually this is really toxic. And so it can definitely be tricky in that way. Yeah. So how do you know that shit is toxic. <laughs> right. So we wanted to go through some kind of key things to look for. And we'll discuss this a little bit as we go. Um, Cause there is nuance to it. It's not so black and white as just like, Oh, well, if there's this, then it's toxic. Even though all of the articles on, you know, bustle or medium or whatever are going to try to sell you on that idea. Um, So we want to go through this. So the first thing that we wanted to get out there is that it's important to understand that because a relationship is toxic does not mean that either of the people involved are a bad person. And this is something I see come up all the time of someone else, like a good friend might be saying, Hey, I feel like this relationship is unhealthy or maybe toxic. And the response is like, no, but you know, they're a really good person or, you know, but, but he's a good person. He's not a bad person, right? Because we have this assumption, like our movies teach us that there are clear heroes and villains and that a villain is just bad all the way through. Everything about them is bad. And that's not actually true of real life. Right. Um, so it's possible to be in a toxic relationship with someone who still is a good person. Um, so just, Keep that in mind, like as we're thinking through this, that we're not trying to say this person is bad or even that they're doing these things intentionally to hurt you. Maybe they are, but not necessarily. Uh, And then the other thing is it's not necessarily going to feel bad all the time. There's going to be good moments too. And that's also what keeps people in toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. All right. So first thing to look out for is kind of check in with your, your gut and ask do you feel like you're always on guard or you spend a lot of time being on guard around this person? Are you kind of walking on eggshells not to set them off, not to do something that's going to upset them? Cause at any moment mm-hmm. they could respond nastily to you or yell at you or right. Like there's different ways that could manifest, but do you, and by checking with your gut, I don't mean like as a metaphor for your intuition. I mean, literally, do you have that feeling in your stomach of like, Ugh. Right. Because that's where we experience. That's where we can feel those stress hormones that Mm -hmm. we talked about earlier. I was going to say, like, talk about having like a constant cortisol release all the time. Like Mm -hmm. if you don't feel like you can 100 percent relax around someone, if you're always anticipating like I might do something wrong or I might make a mistake or they may who knows you know, what mood they're going to be in when they walk, come home from work. Like, I don't know, Mm. you know, like that's definitely a sign that like things may be toxic. Yeah. Um, Or if you're often being compared to others in a adversarial sort of competitive kind of way, uh, we talk a lot about on this show about trying to avoid competition for yourself of like, oh, well, don't try to compare yourself to your partners, other partners or their friends or their exes or anything like that. Um, but that's one thing cause that's in your own head. But if the other person is doing this being like, Oh, well, well Gina doesn't do that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's, or whomever. that's a big warning sign that, that there's a problem here. And again, they might not be meaning to do it badly, but that's a toxic situation for you to be in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And kind of connected to that. Um, another sign is if you feel like you're being manipulated or coerced into doing things and, Manipulation and coercion can show up in a number of different ways. That comparison thing could be a manipulation tactic. Mm. You know, it could be, 
well, my other partner acts this way and you don't act that way. And that's an attempt to try to get you to change your behavior or to change yeah. what it is that you do. It could be guilt. It could be like, oh, I sacrificed so much or I've paid for so much or I've given you so uh -huh. much. And like, why won't you do X, Y, and Z? So it could be guilt as well in order to coerce. Another hallmark of toxicity is gaslighting. Um, we could do a whole entire episode on gaslighting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, just any, we should. Yeah, anytime, you know, you feel like you get through a conversation and you're like, I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Like, I feel like we started out talking about one thing and I don't understand how it ended up with this other thing. If your partner is constantly questioning your experience or insisting like, like, no, like, that's not how things went down. Like, you remember, you're remembering things wrong or no, you're feeling the wrong thing or no, you shouldn't be feeling that way or, or, you know, basically like questioning your personal experience and thoughts and feelings constantly. Um, I think that's the big way that one's shown up for me mm. is that like coming out of a conversation, just being like, do I, like, did I remember? Am I crazy? Uh, yeah, I mean, did yeah, I remember sorry. something yeah. entirely different from right. what yeah. actually happened? Or like, I'd come out of a discussion, kind of going into it, feeling like this is what had happened and this is how I felt, and coming out of it being like, did I completely misunderstand everything? And like, that's like that sort of questioning of like, yeah, it, is my reality altered in some way? Right. Have I yeah. Or like, do, do I have a grasp on reality? Mm. Right. Totally. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, another sign is if there's ongoing negative effects on other people and other relationships in your life, like your family relationships or your friendships or your other partners. And this can also look a number of different ways. You know, it could be that you find yourself isolated from a bunch of other relationships in your life. And that could either be that your partner your, you know, this partner or this person, it doesn't have to be a partner necessarily. Like this person has been really shitty to all these other people in your life. And so they don't want to be around them anymore. And by extension, they mm. don't want to be around you anymore. As long as you're associated with this person, it could look that way. Or it could look like this person, again, kind of trying to trash talk the other relationships in your life to kind of encourage you to self isolate from those relationships. Um, so definitely, you know, I, I would encourage people to always be checking in on like, how are the other people in my life feeling about this relationship? Um, mm. And I think like we said with the, with our last episode, again, like taking it all with a grain of salt, um, but just, you know, trying as best as you can to kind of take a little bit of a step back and kind of seeing like, huh, like how is this particular relationship affecting all the other relationships in my life? Because usually if it's a toxic relationship, there is fallout, um, right. You know, it's actually like relatively hard to keep it contained. Um, yeah. Without it sure. affecting the other relationships in your life. Right. It is going yeah. to affect them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If your moral, ethical, or personal boundaries are pushed against or violated, then that might be a sign that you're in a toxic relationship as well. It, even if it's something as the, or like, well, I really want a specific amount of time with you because we've been seeing each other the longest, but you do not employ like hierarchical relationships in your life. But if that person really is pushing that or really pushing for something else, then that might be a sign that the, this mm -hmm. is not okay, that this is something that you want uh, to stress against. Um, if you're not accepted for who you are, which we talked about before, uh, again, if, if somebody is really trying to change you constantly, whether it be a friend or a, even uh, your family member or um, your significant other, then that absolutely can be toxic for you. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you're feeling just really drained emotionally or depleted after interacting with this person, every single time you're with them, you come home and you feel like, whew, I have a weight lifted off of me because I'm not with them anymore, mm -hmm. then that could be a big sign that you're in a toxic relationship. Well, even more dangerously, though, is is like if you feel drained and depleted, like four out of five times that you spend time with this person and mm. one time feels good, you know, like yeah. I think that's what I, we see a lot with like, especially romantic partnerships that are toxic is mm -hmm. that like, because that one time feels so good, it becomes really hard to objectively see all the rest of the time that feels mm -hmm. really crappy and really draining and depleting. Well, and like, sure. like we talked about in our episode um, 123, gosh, that was a while ago. Uh, about the science of happy relationships is that mm -hmm. even four out of five being bad, that's obviously very bad, mm -hmm. but even 50, 50 
bad to good is still not good, mm -hmm. but that's still yeah. not a healthy relationship. Um, and that in that science of happy relationships, it'd be the other way around. If like one out of five is bad and the other four are good, that's even not really a healthy relationship, right? It's actually much more extreme than that. And I think that we're often taught that it's more normal to have like this 50, 50 kind of thing, either. Cause we saw that with our parents yeah. or it's what's modeled to us on TV shows and in movies and things like that. Um, it's definitely something to be aware. And then the other one is check out episode 131, which is on dumpster fire relationships, which is a little bit similar to some of the stuff we're talking about today. Um, but then going along with that is also if the other person is, unwilling to acknowledge or consider your needs or your feelings or your, or your welfare. Um, and this would be something where maybe you would bring a concern or something that is a need of yours um, or, you know, something that's, that's difficult for you that you want support on or feelings you're having. And instead of trying to find a way to, work with those and accommodate those and be supportive. It's explaining why you don't actually need those things or you don't actually have those feelings or no, that's not something I can do because X, Y, Z, right? Like what doesn't matter what the reasons are, but just being like, no, the welfare of you, whether that's the things you want to do with your life, like your ambitions, or it's some emotional support that you need or some behavior that's, triggering to you that you need to not experience kind of being like, well, no, that's not something you get to ask for. Right. Yeah. So finally, what can we do about all this? How can we clean this shit up? How can we make this toxic dump go away? Well, um, I mean, gosh, toxic cleanup is already just a controversial issue and oh, yeah. it's a big job and yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> Something kind of near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Um, but first of all, recognize that you're in a toxic relationship. So see the signs, listen to this episode and be like, <laughs> oh man, these things are sounding like a relationship that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should do something about that. Um, and really, uh, another thing that you should realize is that you are worthy of being in a relationship with someone uh, that's healthy and that adds to your life that uh, treats you with love and respect um, and this toxicity shouldn't be a part of your life. So definitely first see that this is something that I maybe am in and then believe that this is something that I probably shouldn't be in. Mm -hmm. I'm I, worthy of better than this. I think that step is worth talking about for a second because I feel like just that of like believing that you actually deserve something better than that and that it's possible to find something better than that. I think yeah. that step right there is often the biggest hurdle. Um, oh, yeah. I know like from conversations that the three of us have had over the years that all of us to, to varying degrees have had that experience at probably several points in our lives of staying in a relationship that's not healthy because of this thought of like, but this is probably the best I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. So I need to stick with this one or else I end up with nothing. Right. I think that message is very much driven home to us. Um, and yeah. really, you know, again, from, from movies and from sort of conventional wisdom and stuff like that, this sort of over romanticization of holding on to a relationship Right. And yeah, that or fighting for a relationship. Yeah. Right. And that somehow fighting for a relationship is worth more than an actual good relationship. Um, yeah. And I know that like, it sounds absurd when we say it like that, but like I said, all of us have been in that situation of staying in a really not happy and not healthy situation because it's like, well, but it's better than nothing. And I would actually argue it's not better than nothing. It's worse than nothing yeah. because there yeah. isn't really a nothing, right? Like that study we saw about having positive friend groups, that that is in itself something that will make you live longer. And, you know, even if just focusing on those, those positive friend relationships, that's still going to be a net gain in your life. And the truth of the matter is if this is a romantic partner, there, there are others out there. You're going to find others. I know it's easy to think yeah. you won't ever, right. but that's not actually the case. Right. Yeah. Right. Definitely. 
So doing something like finding therapy or counseling, it can definitely help to identify the toxic behavior that's going on. Mm. Um, I would definitely, if you suspect that you're in some kind of toxic relationship, again, family, friend, metamor, romantic, whatever, doing some kind of individual counseling can help to give not only an objective sense of like whether this behavior is toxic or not, but also it can give you permission to take action. Um, you know, the last time that I found myself on the cusp of leaving an abusive relationship, I went to individual therapy not because I was in this place of like, I want to save the relationship or I need to know how to change myself or I need to know how to cope with this. But it was kind of just this place of like, I just need someone to tell me that it's okay. Like to tell me that like, hey, yeah, this behavior is toxic and it is okay to leave. And that was like so incredibly empowering for me just to have that permission from, uh, you know, from a third party, essentially. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. You can also, if you, you know, if you don't have the funds to go to therapy or to go to counseling, or if you can't find a counselor, you know, where your insurance covers it, or, uh, you know, if you can't find a counselor who will do sliding scale for you, even just talking to a supportive friend or family member or someone that you trust around you um, you know, like maybe they can't give you like fully uh, guaranteed like professional advice. But again, they can be that person who's outside the situation who can just acknowledge like, hey, this behavior is toxic and it is okay for you to do something about it. Um, I do want to put in a quick caveat about couples counseling um, because mm. sometimes people realize like, ooh, this relationship's toxic. Let's go find a counselor um, for both of us so we can work on our relationship. And sometimes that does work. Like it depends on the situation. Like sometimes that is helpful. However, like I was, um, you know, my therapist did inform me. I was really surprised to hear this, that actually, especially when there's some form of abuse involved, they actually discourage couples from getting counseling together because sometimes it results in the person who's being abusive or toxic just getting better at it. As in so like, fascinating. A, like mm. as in able to do it in a way that's not quite so triggering, but still causes like a negative impact or like able to yeah. do it in a way that like maybe they'll look like they're behaving in front of the therapist, but then actually at home, they're able to like pull off some more shady or manipulative or gaslighty stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I think that I would encourage you if you suspect you're in some kind of toxic relationship before opting for couples counseling, do some individual counseling of some kind first mm -hmm. um, to help you, I guess, make a better informed decision about that. Yeah, I think that's so valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that was really interesting when you brought that up, Dedeker, about the couples counseling thing. Yeah, that's probably not something that people would would think to think about or to be wary no. of. Mm -hmm. um, no. But absolutely that could be the case. I know I've definitely read, like, I've definitely had this experience since I started working with people, but I've also read uh, that like a lot of therapists essentially say that like by the time people reach couples counseling, it's often like six or seven years too late, you know, that they should have been in counseling a long, long, long time ago. And now it's gotten to this point where like, it's so entrenched and mm -hmm. it's such like their communication is in such a rut. Like they may have these like toxic dynamics that are just like, have been so practiced and rehearsed and it's just that much harder to even break out of it. And sometimes even impossible because it's gone on for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And that is like we we're saying, if this is something you suspect or maybe see some signs of, it doesn't, necessarily mean that it's gone so far that there's no repairing it or that this person's a terrible person or that they're abusive or something like that. It could just be some toxic elements slipping into this relationship. And the sooner you can start actively addressing that, the better, right? Mm -hmm. The better yeah. chance you have of actually seeing if there is a good relationship at the core of this, this is how we're going to get it is by actually dealing with this head on as early as possible, right? Yeah. Rather than waiting that six or seven years too late Right. And then trying to repair something that's maybe not reparable anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, something that I did want to point out. So when we were talking about the different uh, types of relationships, right? Like the friend or romantic partner or a metamor or um, family or a coworker, these sort of fall into two different categories, right? There's the category that is where I would say friend and romantic partner definitely fit into, which is a relationship that's possible to just leave entirely. And then the other category is like family, 
metamors to a certain extent and coworkers to a certain extent. Or a where, boss. Or a boss, right? Yeah, like a work related relationship where you don't quite have the same amount of freedom to just be like, I'm just out Why? completely, right? Like it might not be so easy to just find another job. Maybe for you it is, but for a lot of people, it's not that simple. Uh, and the same with our family. While some people do have situations where it's like, no, I need to cut off this family relationship entirely. For most people, that's not really an option or doesn't feel like that's really an option. Um, and then with metamors, there's also like, well, you do sort of have the option to leave the relationship that attaches you to this metamor. But again, that, that can be a tricky one. Same with like in-laws is another one that's not your own family, but your partner's family. I think metamors and in-laws are kind of similar in that way. But anyway, with, with all of this is to kind of consider that, right? That certain solutions can work in one situation and maybe not as well in the one where you can't totally leave that. However, it is still possible to create some distance, both mentally, emotionally, as well as actually physically and the amount of time you spend with those people. So again, something I think that a counselor could help with that if you're just like, I can't find a way to separate myself from this situation. Um, but anyway, just something I wanted to throw out there of like that distinction between the relationships you can totally leave and the ones that you can't. Or maybe another way to put it is like the elective relationships and like the like required non mandatory non -elective? Relation non elective relationships. I don't know how to general education. Relationships? Right. Your general education relationships versus your elective relationships. I don't know about that one. <laughs> um, so when we were going through this and we were looking at the different types of advice about how to deal with toxic relationships, what was really interesting is that essentially it boils down, there's like little subtleties, but it boils down to there's really only four choices that you have if you realize you're in a toxic relationship. So option number one is to accept the relationship as it is and just be okay with it. And honestly, in certain situations, that might be a good answer. Right? Of just being like, I'm going to stop trying to change this person and just realize, you know what? It's actually not as big a deal and I'm okay with them being who they are and I'm not going to let certain things affect me as much. And that might be a good solution for you. If it's a really toxic or abusive relationship, definitely that's not a good solution. But if it's really just not that bad, that could actually be good. So number one is to just accept it and be at peace with it. Number two is to change the relationship. So this could be by creating boundaries for yourself. Remember, you're not putting boundaries on other people. You put boundaries on yourself about, I'm not going to be in these sorts of situations. I'm going to find a way to remove myself from them. Um, and remember, you can't change other people, but you can change how you react, right? So again, yeah. putting those boundaries on yourself. Um, and again, with like family relationships, I think this could be a good solution where you can't kind of extract yourself entirely, but that can be a way to sort of put these sort of mental, physical, emotional barriers in place between you and the other person. Uh, the third one is leave the relationship, like we've said before, and we'll say it again, <laughs> if that's the best course of action, if the relationship is intolerable to you in a variety of ways, especially if it's abusive in a variety of ways, then maybe the best course of action is just to leave that shit. Um, and the fourth way, the fourth option for you is just to continue on the same path that you currently are on and just feel miserable and continue to, you know, have the stress cycle keep happening in the way that it's currently occurring. Uh, something that I wanted to bring up before, and I, I forgot about it until just now, is that like often in toxic relationships, the same types of arguments will occur over and over again, or like you'll have a moment in time that happened where you were, you know, not truthful or something, and then your partner may bring it up to you again and again and again. Mm. And I got good advice um, once from a couple's counselor that was, if it's happened in the last two weeks, you can talk about it, but any mm. longer than two weeks, you're not allowed to talk about it anymore. And I think that that kind of goes along with this feeling miserable action, because uh. you can continue to feel miserable and use that same thing that occurred in the past over and over again. Or you can do one of any of the previous things that we talked about, those three, and either accept it, change it and say, okay, these are the things that are not going to happen again. And we're just not going to talk about it anymore. We've 
we figured it out and we're moving on. Mm-hmm. Or if, again, if it's like the worst thing ever, then you can leave the relationship. Mm-hmm. So I would come yeah. in. I'm going to, I'm going to catch you on that one. I would say okay. it doesn't have to be the worst thing ever to leave the relationship. No, you're right. Right. I just mean in your, in your head, if you're like, I can't live no, with I this think, thing. Yeah. I think occurred. like, yeah, if I can't let it go, and you know, if like if I can't let this thing go, the worst. exactly, yeah. then and then, I can't change it, right? Either because yes. they're not willing to, or I, you know, don't feel like that's possible for me, right? Yeah, 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 don't totally. Believe. So I, I think what's there really you have it. what's interesting about including that fourth option that your other option is to feel miserable and to just kind of continue feeling shitty about it is, I think for me at least when you look at it this way where it's like you are making one of these four choices even if you don't make a choice Mm -hmm. right that it's not like i could choose one of those but i'll choose not to it's like no you are making a choice you're making a choice to continue feeling shitty and that's not a good choice right but that is the one you're making you are always making a choice and i think that to me at least was a big wake up call when I had that realization some years ago about a a relationship that I was in of that. It's just like you are making a choice by not making a choice. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Got it. That is a choice. You always have a choice. (laughs) (laughs) Even if you don't want it, you're making it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we would definitely love to hear from you. I mean, we want to know, like, how have you dealt with toxic relationships in the past? Are you in a toxic relationship right now? Are you having trouble figuring out if it's toxic or not? Or do you know that it's toxic and you're not sure how to get out of it? Um, Definitely the best place to share your thoughts on this or your questions about this is with other listeners who have also listened to to today's episode on this episode's discussion thread, which is going to be in our private Facebook or discourse forums. You can get access to both of these groups and you can also join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can also share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. You can leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-05 or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 